For nearly as long as history can remember, there have been tales of a large creature living amongst the snowy peaks of the Himalayan mountains. Today, we're going to look beyond the folklore and explore the evidence, sightings, and theories surrounding one of the most well-known cryptids in the world, the Yeti. This is Red Web. Task Force, welcome back to Red Web. We got another mystery here, another cryptid this week. I'm Trevor Collins, and with me, joining with the gut check, coming in blind, as always, we got Alfredo Diaz. Hello, hello. Of course, we got to talk about Bigfoot's cousin, the Yeti. Well, of course. Uh, there's got to be some theories that they're related or something. Like right. They just look so similar to each other. I'm assuming that people are automatically going to put them like adjacent next to each other on some kind of family tree. Yeah. Like, like the Yeti was the one that was kicked out for uh, doing no good. Yeah, exactly. It's like the shunned cousin, you know, or just like the weird cousin. <laughs> weird cousin. You get the ice. We'll take the nice Pacific Northwest, you know, a little ice, a little summer. I think the Yeti is more intriguing to me because I don't know I, the, the conditions that it must live in and then the areas as well. Absolutely. And things are much more limited and the environment's a lot harsher compared oh, for to... Sure. Bigfoot, who just got it easy in the woods. You know what I mean? There's deer everywhere. Well, hold on. Maybe you're going to try and tackle on a bear or something like that. Like, sure, you got to deal with hunters, but the people think they live in the trees and they travel, so I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm never going to let that down. That's the weirdest That's the weirdest theory to me, that they just are up in the trees. Like They're up in the tree, you know, just can't look up there. Bro, how thick are those branches? That Too high up. <laughs> you know big, what? Thick old Bigfoot. Come on. I'm picturing out Bigfoot hanging up in the canopies, you know, beyond the sight of a human being. But like, that's where the branches are thinnest. So these, this tree is struggling. Like it's that's just a full ass creature just up there. Tree branches bending He's under just the weight. clenching with both arms, <laughs> both legs and the cheek as well. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't need to picture that. Uh, well, hold on. Let me ask you a question. I do okay. want to picture that. Um, <laughs> when you okay. when you see a Bigfoot up in the trees, okay. in your mind's eye, yeah. do you picture like you know two fluffy two cheeks squeezing on that branch, or is it is it like a baboon up there and he's like full moon in it, just uh, bare butt on that Bigfoot? I would like to think that it's functional. The thickness is functional. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That like it acts as. Not only something to to use the extra grip on when they want to just uh, <laughs> lay in the trees leisurely, but then also yes, as like a, as, a, as a soft like bouncing mechanism, right? Bouncing, right? Yeah. And I think that's important that you mentioned that. <laughs> 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 oh man, I'm I'm excited to talk about the Yeti. I did a uh, I had to make a research paper and memorize it so I could do a whole spiel. Oh. Uh, back in like sixth grade about the Yeti. My friend did Bigfoot. <laughs> I did Yeti. And then you guys high five. You're like, yeah. Well, he dressed up in a Bigfoot outfit. I dressed up. I couldn't find a Yeti outfit. So I just dressed yeah. up as someone who would go to the uh, to the Himalayas. And man, that's a smart pivot. Or just buy the Bigfoot costume and just bleach it. Just bleach it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's just dive into it because, you know, this one yeah. is just cryptid. Got some good stuff here. I'm going to talk about the folklore and the description of and the origin, kind of the etymology of the name Yeti. But then talk about some of the sightings. Got some pictures for you, Fredo. As always, these photos will be placed on our YouTube upload as well as our Twitter page, both with the same handle, at Red Web Pod. But let's dive in. We got the Yeti who is believed to be an ape-like creature that resides at high elevations of the Himalayas over there, kind of in between India and China, in that kind of general area, right? Okay, yeah. The Yeti's name comes from the Sherpa word Yete, which translates roughly to cliff-dwelling bear. There's also some people that think that maybe this is from the word Mete, which would mean man-bear because of the hairy nature of it. There are bears in the Himalayas and it stands mm. upright so, you know, you can see it both ways. But there are a plethora of other names out there for Yeti-like beings that many cultures surrounding and within the Himalayas all have. But we're going to use Yeti for the rest of this episode. Now, originally, these creatures were described as hairy men with red fur, unlike modern interpretations, which have white fur. I think that that's very interesting because I didn't really know about that until kind of doing the research for this. See, that's what I assume things like... Bigfoot, maybe even like Mothman or all these other cryptids where it's just like, oh, there there might have been like this group of 
hairy individuals or these group of people who liked wearing large coats and capes and whatnot. And then it was just like jazzed up to be this crazy creature. <laughs> Wait a minute. You think so? There was just a man kicking it in the Himalayas with a nice cape and a monocle, maybe. And I'm thinking for him, it's just like a hairy, a hairy dude, maybe just a hairy family or something. Maybe like just that. a nice hairy jacket. Uh, Stay yeah, warm, it, you could, know? it just could be a super furry jacket, <gasps> and then you know it's probably that's you know, a good lots point. of snow and whatnot. I was talking about like the long cape because and as I was like rambling about this, I went, okay, hold on. I mentioned Mothman, but how would Mothman look like if it was an actual person? Oh man, I like that, like a long coat cape type thing that they Ooh. just always wear. Yeah. Now there's something to that where you take the idea of what a cryptid looks like and you turn it into an actual outfit. Right. Mm, I like that. But I mean, yeah, you you make a good point, especially if this thing's called man bear. Maybe this is just a couple of folk, you know, wearing bear pelts. Yeah. Encumbered by bear pelts. Anyway, it's entirely possible. Um, I think that's a really interesting point, though, is it could just be some sensationalized version of seeing an oddity and then it just becomes kind of this very popular cryptid, right? Yeah, I completely agree. It's just, I think that that's where that comes from. Yeah. Well, the white hair had to come from somewhere. And this was really interesting to me because I thought, you know, if the Yeti exists, of course it would be white because it would blend in. If it's a predator type creature, you don't, you know, you don't want to be seen as this big red monstrous thing running after your prey, right? And so white hair makes sense. But this shakes the foundations of my belief because the white hair may have been added to the Yeti lore after the appearance of the abominable snowman in the 1964 movie Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, according to Dr. Emily Zarka of the YouTube channel Storied. Oh, oh man, I totally forgot that that creature was a thing or it just is it considered a cryptid? Abominable snowman, I think, is synonymous with Yeti. It actually is part of the notes that I have here that we'll, we'll go through. I think it's kind of like a mistranslation. Oh. Yeah. Okay. See, I'm learning so much. This is why I like sitting in on these episodes. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, of course. Thanks for being here. <laughs> That's the thing, though. I, I love that you get to learn with the audience. So you get to ask the questions that they might be thinking. Task force out there might be going, well, what, what, what's abominable? Let me talk about that. Yeah. So we'll get into that. That's uh, I think it is actually part of some of the folklore and some of the stories get mistranslated, and that's where that word comes from. Um, but coming back to kind of some of the descriptions of the Yeti, typically the Yeti is described somewhere close to human in nature, uh, just larger with a bit more body hair. But uh, other depictions, they range, right? Some have them a little bit more human-like, some have them less human-like, some have them with uh, light hair, not too much on the body, and some have them with that thick, fluffy coat that you probably are more accustomed to seeing in art. But beyond the coat and, the, and whatever their hair looks like, they're said to have large, sharp teeth and a very pungent odor. I don't think if I smelled a Yeti, I would want to be anywhere close enough to be smelling it. But if I smelled it, you can consider yourself dead, probably. Yeah, if you're close enough, I'm assuming it doesn't want to be seen or found. And I don't know. I don't think it's like a Disney movie where you're going to become best friends and then right. try and like protect the Yeti from the local authorities type thing. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeti's on the run from the law. <laughs> yeah. Maybe maybe this is like a, a spider situation. It's It's more afraid of us than we are of it, you know? Maybe it's, it's totally it could, fine. It, it could be, but I don't know. Like, I'm assuming the Yeti is a carnivore. And mm. in order to be a carnivore, especially if it's like apex predator, you're going up against polar bears, I'm assuming, are in the... Are, are they in the Himalayas? Probably in the Arctic. Polar yeah, bears. Yeah, polar bears are Arctic. Map. But I don't know if they are uh, in other areas. <laughs> so if we say, I'm going to say task force, if we sound different, we're back at home for this particular recording. Yes. So yeah. With that comes my ability to Google again. Uh, I don't think that they are in the Himalayas. Uh, then I guess they don't really need to be all big and violent to be, who's going to challenge you in alpaca? That's a really good point. Cause it is worth clarifying. They don't hunt humans or so, so it's said that they don't hunt humans that they are nocturnal, and that they hunt smaller animals and are actually known to disembowel their prey, which then calls into question, evolutionarily speaking, right? Scientifically speaking, zoo zoo zoologically speaking. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Why are they so big? <laughs> They're six feet tall, more or less, 
And they weigh between 200 to 400 pounds or 90 to about 180 kilos. Wait, just six feet? Right. So I'm thinking you and I can take this guy on. I don't know about all that, but I mean, like, I was thinking it was taller. Or maybe there's a lady Yeti. Oh, female Yeti. I don't know, man. We're, we're definitely, uh, they got, you know, they outclass us on weight. But I think you and I combined, we stack up. That's true. But I thought I'd be looking up, you know what I mean? Because, yeah, I'm sure they got us in weight. Yeah. Again, I don't know the anatomy of a Yeti. But I'm thinking, like, if you're six foot tall, your arm spans only so far. Well, humans, sure. You know, if this is a different ape-like creature. Yeah, yeah, but that's what I'm saying. I don't know the anatomy. Like, I don't think he's like Kevin Durant where he's got these exceptionally <laughs> long arms that go down. Like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But it also, like, makes me think of things like Gigantopithecus. If you want to, like, base this in fossil records and, and what we know about our own family history or whatever. You got the Gigantopithecus, 10 foot tall monster, you know, stepping around 400 to 600 pounds. Yeah. See, I, I was thinking like seven foot, seven, five, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, that's what I was thinking too. Six foot. I'm not looking up. I'm looking straight at him in the eye. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I want to look a Yeti in the eye, but I mean, I wouldn't want to, but I got to, I mean, if he's up in my <laughs> face, I'm not looking up. <laughs> oh, geez. You smell the smell, you see the pupils, you know you're done. Yeah. I mean, they don't hunt humans, but if you're in front of it like that, you might be done. But uh, much like Bigfoot, who is named for this very same feature, Yetis are known for their very large feet. In fact, we'll talk about some of the photos that have been taken of their supposed footsteps, uh, footprints rather, and they're very stocky. They're very wide given the length. Uh, as opposed to Bigfoot's feet, which is, I think this is the biggest differentiator between these two supposed cryptids that I think delineates them as their own creatures. Not maybe a Bigfoot out of place, but rather, as you were kind of saying, maybe a cousin uh, on the family tree or something like that. Right, exactly. But uh, what's interesting to me, and we talked about history, the first recorded sighting of a Yeti in Western history occurred in the mid-1800s. We have Brian H. Hodgson, a British representative living in Kathmandu, the capital of Nepal. Uh, he was told and wrote about a, quote, wild man covered with long, dark hair and had no tail, end quote. And he claimed it stood on two legs and he thought it was an orangutan at first. But this goes way back into history, longer than I would have thought. Of course, if it's folklore that that makes sense, but mm -hmm. supposedly Alexander the Great himself reportedly wanted to see the Yeti as far back as 326 BCE. So like 2,400 years ago, this guy's like, I want to see the Yeti. How old is this Yeti? Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's one old creature or maybe a, right, again, or that, that secret family. Generations. Yeah, that hollow earth theory. Maybe, they, uh, maybe they're creeping out on the Himalayas every now and then. Get some sunlight. Dude, hollow earth. What do you do? We do an episode on. We that. need to dive into that for yeah, sure. Yeah, it's just so fast. Any movie that has Hollow Earth is always so fascinating. And then mm -hmm. the weird thing too is because we always got to talk about movies on this podcast. The weird thing too is that <laughs> ha I feel like half of the movies that have like Hollow Earth are just like surprise, like they're like they're surprise plots in the movies. Like oh yeah, like um. I mean, this has been out for a little bit, hot yeah, minute yeah, now, yeah. but uh, Godzilla versus Kong. Yep. It just were in hollow earth. I'm like, yeah, oh, suddenly, oh, suddenly there's a, oh, no, yeah, we're in the center of the planet. And you're like, oh, yeah. And I'm like, this is awesome. Yeah, it's very cool. Yeah. Anyways, I, I think it's a really interesting plot device for sure. I think it's just very fascinating because it's it's the earth. You take for granted what it is. And then if you, suddenly there was right. a whole ecosystem inside, you're like, whoa, this is a Pokeball. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then we never open it. Never open it. You don't know what's inside. Uh, but also with regards to Alexander the Great, maybe this was his... Um, you know, he conquered a lot of countries, suffice it to say. I'm not going to go into the history lesson of all of it, right. but uh, very much an expansive empire. You know, maybe this guy was just looking to uh, land grab until he could grab the land that the Yeti was on. Maybe this was his driving force, you know? Interesting. Okay. Yeah. It just calls into question how many cryptids really changed history, you know? That would be... I don't even know how I'd feel about that. Like... I would feel like instead of more surprised, I'd feel just weirded out. It's very, yeah, it would be very strange. Right? Because it's like, oh, it wasn't like the Illuminati that changed history or swayed governments. Right. It's it was just, Bigfoot in a suit. Yeah. Just these <laughs> cryptids. Like, what? Oh, man. Like a cryptid society where they all meet 
in the hollow earth. Damn. Yeah, maybe that's what happened to Mothman. We get a lot of tweets now and uh, and oh, other, yeah. other social things oh, yeah. uh, about Mothman. And like, where did he go? You know what? I think he uh, he proved himself to the cryptid society and uh, he was welcomed with open arms and open wings into the hollow earth. Anyway, I'm way off topic. Let's get back into <laughs> yeah. it. So talking about some of the indigenous peoples of the Himalayas, uh, such as the Lepcha, they worshipped an entity known as Chumung, also referred to in English as Glacier Being. This entity was a god of hunting and the lord of all animals. And in some stories, it was feared by the people and it created a whooshing or whistling sound. So this could also be another kind of origin for this Yeti creature, something that it was built on. Uh, in some Himalayan stories, the Yeti is a physical embodiment of the mountain deities themselves that enacts punishments when unappeased. It is neither fully animal nor fully human, and in this sense, perhaps not even fully alive. Oh, maybe a being beyond the physical realm, even. I I've never heard of that. Like in terms of like a th I mean, yeah, I could see that. Like, mm -hmm. um, I just never thought of of it never being like alive, like a vengeful spirit or or something like right. that. Right, pretty cool. That is, I think yeah, it's a really cool way of thinking about it. It definitely adds a lot more intrigue to something that I mean, when you kind of sister it up to the Bigfoot story. We, uh, you know, you and I, we know pretty well about that. We did a whole episode on it. And so mm -hmm. it's a physical creature walking around the woods. There's a lot of theories as to what it could be. And so I, I really enjoy kind of learning about some of the Tibetan stories and some of the peoples of the Himalayas and, and kind of learning some of their folklore, but also learning how this could um, kind of change how you look at something like the Yeti. Yep. But uh, other Tibetan stories often describe Yeti as kind rather than a vengeful spirit, right? Just more kind. In Tibetan folklore, the Yeti descends from the Buddhist personification of compassion, also known as Chenrezig. And I hope I'm pronouncing some of these proper names properly. Uh, I'm doing my best. Now, some stories claim that Chenrezig uh, and a female ogre, which is a whole different cryptid topic, mated and gave birth to what we now know as the Yeti. Again, neither fully human or animal in, in general, just kind of a hybrid between this Buddhist personification and a female ogre. A female? Oh, all right, now we're getting into territory. I'm just like, uh, just never thought we'd think it's an ogre or some like. Right. Okay. We got some Shrek in here. Yeah. But kind of coming back to that kind version of the Yeti, uh, I really like that angle because, I mean, <laughs> an angry Yeti, I can picture that, but a nice kind Yeti, I like that. You know, like Monsters, Inc.? Yeah. Like yeah. Sully. Yeah, drinking yak's milk, pick all the hairs out, very nutritious. So in that same vein, we have another story here from Lama Sangwa Dorje, who is said to have founded the oldest monastery in Kumbu in northeastern Nepal when he stayed long term in a cave there around 1667. Now, during this time, uh, it is believed that a Yeti was actually helping him by providing him with food. And when the uh... Yeti... Yeah, right? And when the Yeti would pass away, the creatures would leave their scalp and hands, their full hands, as relic with the llama. And one of these relics, uh, these set of hands, is famously known as, and again, I'm going to try my best, the Pongbochi hand, which we're going to talk a little bit more about. Okay. Uh, there's a whole mystery just around that in general, but it will come up in some of the expeditions we're going to talk about. So yeah, I guess they befriended the Yeti or a group of Yeti. It's like deer. Right. Uh, when it's plural, you don't slap an S on it. It's just Yeti is one yeah. and it's also all of them. So I guess they would help each other a little bit. And then as a sign of respect, they would, uh, when the deceased Yeti would pass away, the the rest of the Yeti would, here's the scalp and hands as kind of a relic. It's very interesting. That is really cool. I See, that's what I would like to think it is. Yeah. I just Something don't think nice. It, I just don't, don't think it turns out like that. Right. If it was, right? Like, mm -hmm. um, I don't know. If life could be that simple. Right. Well, let's talk about some of the expeditions into the Himalayas. This is where the meat and potatoes, as I like to say, lives. This is the sightings, the photographs, the sights and sounds of the Yeti. Um, <laughs> maybe not the smells, but uh, expeditions into the Himalayas to search for the Yeti began after British explorer Charles Howard Burry led the 1921 British Mount Everest Reconnaissance Expedition. He found animal tracks at high altitudes and he believed that they were from wolves. But when he found these, one of his Sherpa guides almost immediately volunteered that the tracks must be from, quote, the wild man of the snows. 
to which they gave the full name Metokong Mi, or to translate it into English, filthy slash unwashed snowman. Weird. Very weird. Hey, wh- why are you insulting? Why you got insulted? That's like what I'm that. saying. It's just you're going so hard in the paint. Um, <laughs> I know. Like, get those words out of your mouth, man. He's going to hear you. It's insane. These things cut their hands off for their friends. What are they going to do to their enemies? Yeah, that, you know? that's a yeah. Anyway, they might take some relics of their own, but this is where abominable actually starts to come in because Henry Newman of the Statesman wrote at that time about this finding. But he also mistranslated Meito Kangmi to Abominable Snowman instead, which led to the popular nickname for the Yeti that we know today. So it's very oh. interesting. I mean, Abominable does mean, uh, I mean, I feel like it's a far more offensive version of the word unwashed. So Oxford Languages defines it as, yeah, causing moral revulsion, loathsome, detestable, hateful, odious, obnoxious, and despicable. So yeah, he kind of really added some gravitas, perhaps for the, uh, newspaper sales or something i don't know but yeah that's where abominable comes from yeah i'm sure it makes like a catchy headline but uh i'll be yeah, honest no i didn't i didn't know it was that like offensive of a word like my god i'm just thinking now though <laughs> a newspaper headline that comes through and says behold the filthy snowman <laughs> like, yeah oh that does not have the same ring to it no not at all oh man Well, of course, much like we kind of explored with Mothman and other cryptids, as more Westerners ventured into the Himalayas, more claims of sightings started to arise around the Yeti. And it starts to make you wonder, is this a chicken or the egg situation? Yep. Um, It starts to become very popular. And so people go out there looking for something specific. And of course, if you're looking for it, you might just see it. And it kind of becomes self-fulfilling prophecy and propagates through society. I was just about to say that. I mean, if that's where like, oh, I mean, you, how can you not think that? If that's where all the sightings started spiking, then mm-hmm. it's definitely because people are just like, I don't know, they want to be a part of the story or want to try right. to get famous. The usual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. I mean, it's also worth mentioning, too, that the Himalayas, especially at this time, are not super well known about. I mean, with regards to exploration, of course, there have been mountaineers up in there. I don't pretend to know all the history of the Himalayas, but we're in the 20s. That's all I want to say. And then in the 50s is where we really start to hit Mount Everest. So our short lifespan, you and I, Fredo, knowing about Mount Everest and all the people that have summited the thing really is is all in in near-term history. So the Himalayas are still, especially to Western culture, very intriguing very curiosity driving, right? They seem like a mm-hmm. new frontier in that sense. And uh, not to mention the world's tallest mountain is there. And so of right. course it just feeds into this kind of fever of looking for the unknown. I could see that. A few years later in 1925, Greek photographer N.A. Tombazi spotted a creature on the slopes of the Himalayas. Now when they saw it, it moved out of sight before he could take a picture, but he was able to describe it as quote, Unquestionably, the figure in outline was exactly like a human being, walking upright and stopping occasionally to uproot or pull at some dwarf rhododendron bushes, end quote. He also claimed that the creature was dark against the snowy terrain, which kind of checks off the idea of that kind of unwashed look or maybe that red hair look. Uh, But Tombazi and his group even saw footprints, which were similar to humans, but he said that they were about six to seven inches long, by four inches wide. So very stocky on a foot. Damn. <laughs> but see, then, like, if, if any footage comes up, then it's automatically like the blurriest, mm-hmm. uh, most low res figure you've ever seen. Right. A lot of artifacting. Cryptids have got to be like terrified. Te- not everyone's got like a 4K camera in their pocket. Right. Man. That's the thing, too, though, man. I've been on Cryptid Talk, I was just on there earlier today. And the compression is not keen. It's not great. And so they compress these these videos in the woods where there's a lot of noise or it's dark. And you go, great, we've gone back to the 1950s with this right. <laughs> with this camera quality. But I don't know. I, I think on one hand, I think that that noise can add artifacts, which maybe make you see things. And then on the other hand, if you can catch a 4K footage of a, of a Yeti, I will be hype. I don't know. I like to believe it. 
Um, and I mean, there's people that can also like break it down and see if it's like photoshopped or, you know, digitally enhanced in any way. That's true. And it would shake people up. I'll tell you that much. Oh, yeah. I would just want to know how, like how through all these years are you able to just hide? Right. Teach this thing some language. I don't know, sign language, English, some, you know, whatever it might Anything, speak. Morse code, whatever. Sit down with the thing. Yeah. And then say, first of all, how? Yeah. Okay. Just, to, just, just say it. Um, <laughs> that would be the one thing. If I could, if any of these cryptids were real and I could yeah. ask them one thing. Oh. How, how are you hidden for so long? And where is the entrance to hollow earth? I mean, that's the second question. Yeah, Easy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> how do I get to Hogwarts? Oh, now that's the question. <laughs> I've been re- I've been rewatching the Potter films. I'm sorry. I'm into it. I'm there. <laughs> Take me back to my teens. Anyway, again, off track. This is the number one movie podcast about mysteries. I mean, what am I supposed to do? That it is. Now, in 1951, we're going to flash forward a few decades here. We have another expedition to Mount Everest. Mountaineer Eric Shipton came across Yeti footprints and photographed them, as well as uh, the trackway, which eventually led to an impassable crevasse. So essentially saying he found some footprints, took a photo of them. We have those photos for you now. Fredo, we can show you those. Everybody else, Task Force, check out um, our Twitter page and YouTube page, like I mentioned. But uh, yeah, there you go. If you want to check out the photo of the uh, of the foot and then also a photo of the kind of path of the footprints. Now, one thing about the foot <laughs> is this it's is chonky, comically fat. It's chonky, dude. Look at that big toe. Well, the big toe is like, it's like, what are Mickey's ears? <laughs> it's so comically huge. And then the three, like, I guess like, um, last toes on, I don't know, like the, the, the pinky and the ones next to the, I don't know what those are called. The, oh, the ring toe in the middle toe. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Ring toe and middle toe. I don't They're, know. They're uh, absurdly small. Like they're yeah. so, they're like baby tiny. It just baby so Baby tiny. And then I guess like the, if you were to call it the index toe, um, the pointer toe, (laughs) the pointer, it's just kind of thick. And you know what? That says ogre to me. That's so weird. Looks like he picked up his mom's feet. Yeah. If you told me that was an ogre, maybe that makes more sense. Uh, Not that that really makes sense. I don't know. But like, (laughs) that's a little wild. Yeah. It's very wild. That's a weird looking foot. Yeah. And I mean, here's the thing. You see a pickaxe next to it, but for the sake of your mental map of this foot, because we're going to work our way around it. These prints were measured as 13 inches long and eight inches wide. So again, now we have an upscaling of the footprint from about 20 whatever years ago, 26 years ago. But this time it's almost three times as long and twice as wide. So it's maintaining that very stocky stature which is interesting because Bigfoot always was very long and not as wide, still wide, obviously, but proportionally right. speaking would be like for this width, probably like twice as long or something. Yeah. That's, I just don't know how you have any stability with. That's what I'm thinking. It makes me wonder what kind of frosty stability you have with such a tree trunk of a footstep. Yeah. Like doesn't make any sense. I mean that big toe though, that's going to be a strong toe for hooking onto rocks and stuff. Yeah. But- I got one big I gotta stop toe. looking at that foot. I'm I'm getting a weird smell. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> I you can almost know. smell it. I can smell it. Here's the thing too, is that when I look at the photo of the uh the the trail of footprints that were left behind, which you can see in front of your eyes here too, they're faint. Yeah. But they're very close together. Yeah, why are the footsteps so close? Yeah, that it just I don't know. It makes me wonder if somebody didn't go through and maybe stamp these along. They're also incredibly linear and very close together so there's almost no gate as it were between the steps but also not a very wide creature so unless he's walking like a runway model where he's one foot in front of the other uh yeah i don't know it just those are my observations yeah those footsteps are so close together that's so weird yeah so that is uh, the Shipton prints, as they're called. And, and a lot of people believe these so-called Shipton prints to be some of the strongest pieces of evidence to the Yeti's existence. Now, in subsequent decades, I would say uh, a lot of truth has come forward about faking footprints, especially on the Bigfoot front, because mm-hmm. um, it's, it's just a common thing, right? Crop circles are another thing that people can easily fake, whether some are real or not, up for debate. But... Uh, It's hard to say, like, you could fake this stuff, so... Oh, the 1,000%. Yeah. Remember uh, the Loch Ness Monster? It was like a little 
toy oh, you're right. boat and someone like made like a little like a, I don't know paper mache neck head right. type thing like oh I totally forgot about that yeah we did a whole episode task force if you haven't listened to it Loch Ness there's that famous photo like the famous photo yeah I yeah. can't believe that like the famous photo is literally mm -hmm. like a big old fake and it was like they came out and said yeah oh yeah it's fake deeply upset me I That's still crazy. believe it's such damn a famous it. photo like I've seen that photo so many times she's still real to me damn it Right, well. Nessie, I know you're out there coming for that Scottish treasure. Anyway. Oh, weird. <laughs> yeah, well, I didn't tell you about that part. I kept it to myself in the episode. I want to let you know about the doubloons the that she's holding on. <laughs> so let's talk about another expedition. So I wanted to mention the Shipton Prince because they are very commonly referred to. Uh, we're going to have some more footprints come up here in a little bit, and they only get bigger and bigger. So I'm wondering if this is the same creature growing, or if this lends credence to the idea that oh, there is a family yeti. of big feet. Or Sorry, Yeti. Baby feet's out here, dude. Baby feet's just envious. <laughs> Cousin to baby hands. All right. So May 29th, 1953, Sherpa Mountaineer Tenzung Norgay and New Zealand Mountaineer Sir Edmund Hillary became the first recorded people to reach the summit of Mount Everest. So again, this is kind of what I was talking about. In the early 20s, a lot of allure. In mm -hmm. 1953, we finally have people, at least in documented history, to right. summit the beast that is Mount Everest. So, as you can imagine, this only influenced more people to venture to the highest reaches of the Himalayas. It only instilled more curiosity about the area to, to the wide world and drew a lot more of attention, right? And so the yep. story of the Yeti just kind of built on from there. But what's interesting about these two in particular is that when they came back from their trip and gave stories about summiting Mount Everest, they claimed they also saw the Yeti during their expedition, which is very interesting. Okay. I feel like they're just kind of throwing that on and it's just like, hey, right. we're, we already got the, the public's eye. Like, let's beef it up even more. Right. But why? I, hey, I, we, you know, we just summoned that huge mountain. But also, we saw the Yeti. I, right? Exactly. Well, that just reminds me of a personal theory I have that is not in my notes that I can't wait to uh, dive into later on. Okay. Um, that's going to blow your socks off. But let's come back to Edmund Hillary for a second. So... One of his later trips, he returned with three relics from temples, including one from Kumbu, a 300-year-old Yeti scalp. Remember, we talked about those earlier. They were the relics of the scalps and the hands that were left. Right. Um, yeah. And so... I didn't even think about those popping mm -hmm. back up. I'm really happy that they exist because that's that's that tangible stuff that you love so much that it could be tested. Exactly. So Hillary, he goes back out on one of his future trips and he returns with three of these. And supposedly one of them is a 300 year old Yeti scout. Now in exchange for the important relic, Hillary donated to the monastery as well as the local school. He also had to agree to have a guardian accompany him as he traveled back with the relic. Sir Hillary brought them around the world to be examined and eventually they turned out to be a portion of hide from either a bear or a goat. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I do, I do love the fact that this was like something tangible and mm -hmm. it was investigated. Absolutely. A lot of times it's just like, we'll have something like that and everyone just goes, I don't know, I guess, maybe, we don't know. And it's like, test the damn thing. Right, just test it before you lose it because we know you will. Every yeah, good thing gets yeah. lost. I hate it. There was that one episode where, yeah, there there was an important piece, piece of evidence and got lost in the mail. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, Christian, help me out. Do you remember that episode? Christian, you remember. My audio wasn't working. What was the what was the question? <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> our man in the chair is uh, <laughs> having some tech the, issues today. <laughs> the man in the chair is just like he doesn't hear us. He's in a massage chair sleeping. <laughs> uh, there, what was the episode where important evidence was being shipped around, and before it could be made to the facility the lab to be tested, it got lost. Do you remember oh, that one? Um, I think it was Bigfoot. Of course. It was <laughs> no, no way. Let me let, let me let me double check. I'm pretty sure it was. Task Force right I mean, now is like no. Oh, they know. They're letting us know right now. But here's the thing: I would rather it be on a cryptid than a true crime episode. You know what I, I mean? Completely like, agree. Oh, but at the same time, still equally frustrating. At the end of the oh, day, yeah. to lose stuff. But hey, speaking of losing stuff, 
uh, this episode's going to feature some lost items. Is, what? No. Yeah, something else is going to get lost. Wait, seriously? Yeah. Oh, God damn. <laughs> so I'll let Christian look that up. But eventually, you know, after receiving the results from many of his expeditions, Hillary then believed, okay, the Yeti is a myth. Despite having seen it, despite having received these relics and testing them, he then decided, in his own opinion, nah, I'm going to go ahead and say this is a myth. Uh, what's interesting to me, though, is when they're testing the DNA of this hide, they either say, well, it's a bear or a goat. And I would imagine that you would be able... I'm not a DNAologist, right? But No. They're not the you, same creature. You think they're not... One, they're not the same creature, and they wouldn't even be, like, genetically similar enough to claiming it's one you know either or but who knows the freezing stuff the temperatures and yeah i just hope they're they're not going off of looks like somebody held this up and smelled it and pet it a little bit and said yep that's bear <laughs> you know I, I i hope some dna evidence went into this and that they just weren't able to recover full dna profiles it depends on the quality of the grade you know what i'm saying oh like right, 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 right right that leather that is, is a it's a high grading company then and it makes sense that they, you know, they have the machines and they test it. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, you know, you got to be careful with that Yeti leather. It's very delicate, very rare. I would be so careful with that. I feel like it would just <laughs> crumble and break apart and shatter into pieces. It's true, especially since it's been in the Himalayas for all this time and it would be preserved pretty well in the cold. But let's talk about the last kind of expedition here. before you do i found it it was not bigfoot it was the hinter kaifek murders oh yep. no skulls of the victims were sent e. to a clairvoyant yep. and then in that whole process the heads were lost it's even worse i have such conflicted emotions it wasn't a cryptid but it was also a true crime but also it wasn't going to a lab it was going to a clairvoyant yeah anyway oh the hinter kaifek murders very interesting stuff task force we did a whole episode on it if you want to hear a little bit more of our displeasure with the, the handling of that evidence, God. Uh, go check it out. Hey, everybody. How you doing? This is Trevor coming right back at you. Happy New Year. By the way, I know we're starting to get into it now, so you're probably you're tired of hearing it, but I just wanted to say it. I hope you're doing well. Thank you, Task Force, for listening all the way through the last year and into this next one. Hope you're enjoying the Yeti episode. Speaking of cryptids, I know I've been teasing this, and that's my fault. I've been teasing it for way too long, but we finally have some dates coming up for the cryptid pin set. It's going to look like it's next month here in February. Uh, stay tuned. We're going to give you the specific dates as it approaches. But uh, if you're excited for that pin set, I think we also have a hoodie for you. So we have a small red web collection coming at you. So, uh, you know, save those pocketbooks and uh, get ready to join the task force if you haven't already. But uh, with that said, I want to talk about some of the fantastic sponsors we have that help bring this show to you. This episode of Red Web is sponsored by ExpressVPN. I don't like people stealing my data, if I'm honest. I use ExpressVPN when I'm gaming online or if I'm browsing and I want to make sure that my uh, my searches or my gaming or whatever, my IP is private. And I can do that without any lag to my gameplay or anything like that, thanks to ExpressVPN. It's very nice that we have this service. And I know most of you are probably thinking, why don't you just use incognito mode or something to that effect? Well, let me tell you something there, pal. Incognito mode does not hide your activity from your ISP. It doesn't matter what mode you use or how many times you clear your browsing history, okay? Mom's not gonna find out, but someone will, okay? Your internet service provider, your ISP, can still see every single website you've ever visited. It all comes right through their servers and on to you. That's why even when you're at home, you should never go online without ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN is an app that reroutes your internet connection through a secure set of servers so that your ISP cannot see what the websites are that you are visiting. It runs in the background, it's very lightweight, and only requires the press of a button in order to be protected. It's pretty, uh, pretty easy, pretty nice like that. So protect your online data today with a VPN that's rated number one by Business Insider. You can visit our exclusive link task for us by going to expressvpn.com slash redweb. You get an extra three whole months for free on a one-year package deal. All right, that's expressvpn.com, E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash redweb, expressvpn.com slash redweb to learn more and let them know we sent you. Protect that data while you're investigating. This episode of Red Web is also sponsored by Raycon. If you didn't make a New Year's resolution yet for this year, I get it. I don't like to make promises to myself that I'm never going to uphold, but... 
that doesn't mean you shouldn't find a way to shake things up a little bit, whether it's just a new workout routine, changing your vacation spots, maybe just going outside more. That's my little New Year's resolution to myself here. Uh, However you choose to do something new this year, though, there's no better way to do it than with a pair of Raycon wireless earbuds to make sure that you're getting full uh, with those Red Web mysteries, maybe some music on the side. I know, listen, you can't listen to us all the time. You got a little, get a little bit of music in there too, but they're everyday earbuds that they have. They feel, they look, and they sound better than ever. They're always upgrading, which I like, and they now have an awareness mode for you when you need to hear what's going on around you, right? You know, sometimes you're lost in the mystery, okay, and you're walking down the street, You need to be aware of your surroundings as well, and thankfully, they got you covered. And Raycons also offer eight hours of playtime and a 32-hour battery life. Okay, that's like eight episodes at minimum of Red Web that you could be listening to on the go, sleek and seamless, stylish as always. I have a pair of wireless Raycons myself. They're nice and blue. Love the color. And I also love just that they don't stick out a whole lot. They're very low profile, and they stick right in there. They have the adjustable little plastic rubbery things, whatever they're called, the little ear hole things. Uh, (laughs) I like that because I have big ears. Let's be real. But right now, Task Force, you can get 15% off your Raycon order if you go to buyraycon.com slash redweb. Again, that's buyraycon.com slash redweb to save 15% off your pair of Raycons. Buyraycon.com slash red web listen in style and uh and be aware of your surroundings maybe if you're doing a little bit of rando nautica geocaching you know what i mean but uh as always be careful out there and let's get right back to that yeti goodness uh coming back to that last expedition that we're going to talk about before we come into the more recent years and some of the stories and evidence there right because i should Mm -hmm. say they didn't test the evidence for dna I forgot we're in the past, right? It's in the 50s. So, of course, they didn't test it for DNA. They tested it for uh, probably the hair follicles, the, the look of the skin. The is, the hair in particular is what they really compare against. And so that's why you have that bear or goat thing. But starting in 1957, there was a Texan businessman named Tom Slick who led a supposed reconnaissance mission. I don't know why it's in quotes, but it was a reconnaissance mission into the Himalayas for the Yeti. Slick's group supposedly found tracks, hairs, and even fecal matter, and supposedly the fecal matter was tested and could not be identified, and found, even within the fecal matter, unidentified parasites. So not only do we have a cryptid potentially on our hands, Mm. because it has some unidentified fecal material, we also now have cryptid parasites along with it, which means there might be some whole cryptid ecosystem out there. (sighs) got some unknown parasites See, i mean is it, is it just because we haven't explored much of the himalayans maybe i would be very right? curious to find out if that was a, a a presently known but at that time not known parasite yeah exactly also i don't want to ever discover parasites no that seems like the worst thing to discover because then i start thinking about all these movies i've seen where people get their minds melted or their bodies snatched or uh, i i don't like that oh you're thinking about the extremes Right. Well, you, I mean, when you're when you're dealing with Yeti parasites, who knows? Uh, yeah, you're right. You never know. It's all he gets. It's on like germs and viruses yeah. and whatnot. Well, Slick didn't stop there. That was his expedition, but he funded many other expeditions in search for the Yeti. On one such funded expedition, there was a man named Peter Byrne who stole fingers from the Pongbachi hand. Remember, that was one of the relics from Kombu that we talked about earlier. Right. He stole some fingers, right, because it's uh, supposedly a hand of a yeti. And he did so after the monks who owned it refused to let him take the piece for study. So he's like, all right, well, I'm going to show you yoinks the fingers. And to disguise his crime, he replaces the fingers with human bones. I don't know where he sourced those bones from. I'm not going to ask. What? Uh, <laughs> okay. And then from there, it only gets stranger. Actor James Stewart joined in and reportedly just stole the entire hand. Just yoinked the whole thing. And that's where the what? thing then went missing, which I think is a, a kind of a mini mystery in and of itself. The disappearance of the Pangbachi hand. Uh, oh. Like, what kind of poor security system do they have where people are just walking up snatching this thing? I mean, to be fair, they're just monks living in their True. monastery. They True. don't expect people to come through and just yoink. Uh, but, I mean, you're not wrong. 
maybe keep an eye on it. But maybe like a chest with a lock or something. Right. Yeah. But yeah. So supposedly. James Stewart then came through, regardless of the fingers or not, just yoinked the entire hand. And now that is out in the world somewhere, uh, I think lost. So if that was a real Yeti hand, I guess we'll never know. Oh, you hate you hate to see it like that. Mm hmm. So those are some of the older expeditions and the goings on, the sightings, uh, the footprints, the the hand, the, the scalp, everything and the way they tested it then. Now, let's talk about some of the more recent updates Starting in 91 and then coming very recently to uh, to our own backyard in time here just a few years ago. Uh, but again, you know, throughout these expeditions, some Yeti hair was collected, some fecal matter was collected, and eventually the advent of genetic testing came around. So in 1991, the Pangbochi hand was obtained by the television show Unsolved Mysteries, which is a show I basically grew up on. They performed a DNA test on the hand and found it to be, quote, near human. Which is interesting. Not not human. Uh, not not human. Uh, near human. But like it's such a like cop out. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. For near sure. Near human. How can you be near human? Uh, anyway, so like I said, watching Harry Potter. So in 2013, uh, very recently now, Brian Sykes of University of Oxford performed DNA tests on the hairs that were believed to be from the Yeti. So now we got that tangible evidence coming back into play. His team identified the hares as an ancient polar bear species, which is very interesting to me. Oh. Especially if polar bears aren't native to that area, but were they? Especially if it's ancient. See, now it comes full circle. Polar bears. I mean, that makes sense. I think bears in general just make sense, you know? I, I completely agree, but we're not talking about how they weren't native there. I, I search ancient polar bear and... I get so many pictures of the Yeti. Really? Early polar bear discovered in the Arctic tundra about 120,000 years ago in the time of the woolly mammoths. So maybe these were just like woolly men and women. Uh, woolly people. Interesting. Anyway. Like Ice Age. <laughs> so he, so they identified these hares as ancient polar bear species. Very interesting because... It means like the peoples of the Himalayas w had held on to those artifacts or somehow found them. And so regardless of them actually being from a Yeti or not, those are wild artifacts to have procured. Yeah, no, they definitely are crazy artifacts regardless of what they are. Mm hmm. I mean, regardless of them being the Yeti or not. But that's as near human as a banana is near human. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> they all have DNA, but it's like 80 percent shared. It's. I don't know. I think you're definitely right that it was a cop out for television, Unsolved Mysteries. But let's jump to 2017 now. Dr. Charlotte Lindquist of the University of Buffalo tested hairs, teeth, skin, fecal matter, and a thigh bone, all from the Himalayas. And in an Animal Planet documentary, they they wanted her perspective on this. And so they provided her with all of these specimens. And they were found to belong to various bears native to these mountains. So that, I guess, kind of answers your question. Polar bears might not be native here. However, right. there are two endangered and ancient bears that are native to this area. You have the Tibetan brown bear and the Himalayan brown bear. Oh. When you look up these bears and what they look like, you, you can't say that they're red. But they definitely have... As one who uh, I'm colorblind, so I look at I look at these brown bears, and I can see how one might misconstrue a little bit of reddish out of their out of their brown fur. I'm trying to I'm trying to like really stretch right the limits here, but um, I I could definitely see how somebody could see this at a distance. A bear can stand upright, and how this might look uh, yeah. like a yeti, especially the pre white hair yeti. Yeah, at a distance, and then like if it's like. I don't know, light blizzard or snowstorm, something mm -hmm. like that. Like, how are you going to identify anything at all? Right. Well, then, specifically on April 9th of 2019, the Indian Army posted images to Twitter of, quote, mysterious footprints. Very interesting stuff. So they said in their tweet, for the first time, a hashtag Indian Army Mountaineering Expedition team has cited mysterious footprints of mythical beast Yeti measuring 32 by 15 inches close to Makalu Base Camp on 9 April 2019. This elusive snowman has only been sighted at Makalu Barun National Park in the past. What? So they have photos of the team that found it, where they were that when they found it, 
uh, a close-up of the foot and then also the the walking gait of these footprints. And from the photos, I mean, we'll share the Twitter post with you here. Um, and if you want Task Force, if you want to check them out, it's at ADGPI for the Indian Army's verified Twitter page. And uh, again, I gave you the date. So go way back, April 29th, 2019, at 12, 13 p.m. is when they posted it. You can check that out yourself. But the photo of the foot looks kind of like a boot. It does look like a boot. You know, uh, in, slosh, in slush, rather. Um, uh, the footsteps are more spaced apart. So, you know. Yeah. It definitely looks like somebody walked along there. I but thought about that there, but... Uh, yeah? How is it so... There's, like, no toe marks or anything. Right. Maybe, uh, maybe Yeti copped a couple of Nikes, you know? <laughs> I mean, like, why not? <laughs> just, I mean, good luck finding a size. Just... Go like right. finding Nikes out there, let alone a, the size that fits you. The hyper wide. I mean, 13 inches long is one thing. The the eight inches wide is another. Yeah. Yeah. These these don't fit that kind of general di- like dimensions. It Okay. So it doesn't look like the dimensions they give, which again was 32 inches by 15 inches. So this again, it's the same kind of scale, the same proportion, but way bigger than the last footprint we were talking yeah. about, let alone the early footprint we talked about. So... I don't know. A lot of people gave them backlash because they're saying, hey, you know, you're just kind of feeding into this this hype, this this potential pseudoscience, really. Mm. Right. As a national army, you shouldn't really be doing that. But it did spark a lot of new interest in this mystery, which has kind of kept it alive in these recent years. But I don't know. I, I, I really appreciate the fact that there are still, you know, some tricklings of potential evidence here in the recent decade. Yeah. I mean, I'm all about keeping it alive. Yeah. You know? Well, beyond the story, I think it's just really interesting. But also, it's not very often that we talk about cryptids in particular, where there is evidence that continues up to today. Normally, yeah. it's like, oh, back in the early 1900s, that's right. where there's a bunch of sightings, early, and that was it. Yeah, or early 2000s or something like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, the thing is, like, why isn't there, I don't know, frozen poops or fur or anything? Right, I mean... That's the thing too. Your uh, bodies don't really decompose at a at a very quick rate up in the mountains, right? We had a whole mystery yeah. about Skeleton Lake, uh, it, not in this specific area, but in a very close nearby area stretch of the Himalayas there, and there was a lot of bodies found there that were super old that they just didn't decompose. There's also a lot yeah. of people like Green Boots uh, on the path, the trek up Mount Everest, where people who tried to summit unfortunately came to the conditions and passed away yeah. and it becomes more dangerous to bring them down so they leave them there and that's so crazy still. it is oh, it's very crazy but then they end up just kind of being there and time passes by but everywhere but for them you know they they look mm-hmm. like the day that they passed and so it yeah you, that's a very good question Frey, because it makes you wonder if there is a yeti trouncing around in the himalayas why don't you see any of them that have passed away, right? I mean, granted, maybe they, you know, they take the bodies and whatnot, but I don't know. You think there'd just be maybe like one or two or something would happen, mm-hmm. like a natural disaster up in the mountains, and they don't have that ability to just take right. the dead or themselves. Yeah. That's wild. I was I was reading this article the other day, and I'm, again, by reading article, I'm a millennial. That means I just read the, the title and <laughs> um, the headline, and... Suffice it to say, essentially, there was a uh, an earthquake, and I believe it was the Himalayas. Again, I don't remember. I didn't internalize this piece, but I believe there was an earthquake that somehow unsurfaced and uncovered a several hundred year old body that somebody that had passed away and maybe been buried or lost up in the mountains, and they came down a river that had since been because of the earthquake dislodged or something. Basically, oh. they were found because of that, and they were in pristine condition, and people were like, "Who is this?" Uh, and it turned out they were like 300 years old. That, I feel like, would be wild if there was some wild earthquake or something. And then right, a Yeti cemetery loose. showed up and it would just be like mind bending. I mean, it, I mean, as I say, it's definitely possible. It happened. <laughs> yeah. So that kind of brings us up to today. This is, I mean, the quick and dirty, as every episode tends to be. The, the, as, as much information as we can pack in, but uh, I really enjoyed exploring some of these more recent pieces of, of supposed evidence and some of the DNA exploration that they did in recent years because, I don't know, I think it, for me, helps lay it to rest a little bit more. 
I think something like Bigfoot, I still want to keep my mind open to the possibility. But for the Yeti in particular, I feel like, you know, and we're about to dive into the theories, but uh, yeah. one of these theories really, I think, stands out to me personally. But before we get into them, how do you okay. feel? Like with all this, the evidence and the photos uh, and like. I definitely find the Yeti to be way more interesting than Bigfoot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think that like the location, um, kind of like some of the lore behind it or possible lore behind it. Um, and I feel like there's just so many different paths that this creature could have came from. Right. It could. Be, oh, absolutely. Um, it just could be a number of things, even as going as far back as this is just like a creature that survived the ice age or something like that. Like, Ooh, all of it's be very, cool. all of it's very intriguing. And, and like, yeah, no, I could, I, I don't know. I just find it really fascinating. Just like the locations in general. I agree. I think it's way more fascinating because we have more information around it. You have the folklore, you have the history. Uh, the location is very, very cool and way different than any other cryptid. Mm -hmm. I think that's what, like all that extra information kind of helps solidify in my mind, my own opinion. And that's where Bigfoot kind of just being this entity off in the woods kind of makes it a little bit more open-ended for me on that front where I can still maybe go, okay, I guess I could see Bigfoot being a thing, but I don't know. Uh, maybe, maybe these fall under the same camp. And if one's debunked, both are, but yeah, I think that's more interesting, but easier to, to debunk, I think because of that. At the end of the day though, I feel like it's just, just people, you know, there was just, it's just folklore. And then there's just these people who are trying to create evidence around it. Yeah. On, on both ends, you know what I mean? Oh, definitely. I mean, it's, it's like for one of the, one of the stories is that it was a deity, right? And so, yeah, on, on one hand, you want to like support your beliefs and you want to believe in the beliefs that you were raised on. And on the other hand, you might have people coming through that want to capitalize on a fascinating yeah. story, but let's dive into the theory. So theory number one, I think we, we lightly talked about throughout the episode. And I think, you know, even before I really dove into this research myself, kind of comes to mind naturally and that this is nothing more than bears in the area. It is primarily believed that many who believe that they saw the Yeti are actually just seeing bears or other animals in general. It doesn't have to be a bear in particular, but uh, in some Sherpa legends, the Yeti is actually a bear-like creature. In fact, there are three different kinds of these bear-like creatures. Uh, the Shipton print, when you look at those or when those have been analyzed and compared to bear footprints, they do have some differences, right? Like this, this foot that was photographed had that really big, distinct big toe, right? <laughs> yeah. Large gap between that and all the other smaller ones. And bear paws tend to be a little bit more uniform and more unique. Um, as well as being equal in height and width, but uh, right, but not too dissimilar. So that would be like the biggest wrinkle for this theory. But many of the Yeti's features that have been talked about, the height, the coloring of the fur or hair, uh, etc., all kind of also are shared with bears, whether it be a polar bear or a Himalayan brown bear or, or what have you. These are all features that one can find in bears. And the Himalayan brown bear is actually very unique to this area with a distinct genetic history, having derived its own genetic line 650,000 years ago from other brown bears. So all that is to say is there is a long standing history with these bears in this area. I think it was interesting to note that the white hair on the Yeti has not always been at the forefront. In fact, most of history, it was known as a red haired creature. That's insanely fascinating. It really that's, that's is huh? all I've known it to be. Yeah. It's just like this white haired creature. Yeah. It, I, I find it strange, especially like going back to the YouTube channel storied to kind of quote them and, and their position on it, but that it derived from the Rudolph, the red nosed reindeer movie and their depiction of the abominable snow, right. snowman. Like that's like, so strange. Yeah. Kind of see it. Yeah, for sure. Mm hmm. But with regards to the Himalayan bears, they are in fact endangered, so it would make sense that they aren't seen very often. They're not extinct, uh, so you would still see them, but just, again, not very often. Brian Sykes, who I talked about before, uh, his research suggests this and believes that the Yeti could actually be a hybrid, perhaps, between polar bears and the brown bears. So maybe something that we haven't properly seen before and would be way less common because, I mean, you just wouldn't see it very often. This would be a very rare occurrence to have. 
And so on the very few times that it has happened, maybe people have been around to see it, which would then answer maybe why we saw as humans uh, had a hot spot in the 20s and 50s for these sightings. Yeah. And not so much now. It, yep. Because maybe it was the same bear, you know, I don't know. Especially when the DNA that they tested actually matched a polar bear jaw's DNA. And that polar bear jaw was from around 40 to 120,000 years old. So oh. basically there's a lot of possible range in this theory for it to be a bear. I mean, it just it just makes the most sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's bears in that area and it just, I don't know, like to think that it's this creature that we just haven't been able to pinpoint. I don't know. I, I, I think it's just, yeah, it's just a bear. And from a distance. Yeah. I mean, it's not, it's, it's definitely not the most exciting answer, but I, no, I mean, and I, and I'm one of those people I, I want to believe, but at the same time, it's just pragmatically this, it just addresses all the kind of inner questions I have. Yeah. I, I think like it lines up nicely for me. Mm -hmm. That's why I like, I'm sure there's other theories and I'm excited to hear about it because they're yeah. always so fascinating, but I'm pretty sure like this is where I'm going to end up lining up with. Yeah. Well, I still have my uh, very avant-garde theory that I'll throw in here. This is more of a thought. But anyway, the next theory that I'm going to talk about is that the Yeti is simply a myth that all the evidence around the Yeti is either a hoax or convenience in order to kind of build up the story. But the concept itself is still very real in the realms of folklore and many of the cultures that surround the Himalayas. The folklore from these groups have different messages, but communicate a very important part of their culture. For example, some people believe in the in the area that the Yeti represents the danger of high altitudes of the Himalayan mountains. In other cultures, it represents the unknown, the otherworldly aspects of these peaks. And I think that that's very poetic. I think that makes a lot of sense, you know, because when you really look at it, again, pragmatically, mm -hmm. uh, it stands to reason that these are just stories that one would tell their child so they don't go trouncing out into the unknown. Because again, these are very high altitude mountains, very treacherous, very, very dangerous, even for a trained professional. And so True. you want to train your kids to not just go trouncing off through the snow and disappearing. So maybe you put a little bit of fear in them with the sense of, hey, you, don't, you just don't go out there, not because it's dangerous, because you're a but child, yeah. because of a Yeti. I'm not... Saying that's that's the best way to go about it, but uh, you know that'd keep me off the mountain. It makes the most sense. I don't know why I didn't like think of that. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, it's just you know made up thing in terms of just to tell kids. Yeah, but uh, to expand on the the idea of this story, the Yeti representing the unknown and otherworldly aspects of these peaks, um, w within these these stories, this is where the Earth meets the spirit world. And again, I, I really want to indulge in this kind of folklore stuff because I find it so deeply fascinating. But the Tibetan stories tell of a being who is neither fully spirit nor fully human. And that because this is the place on Earth where the physical realm meets the spirit world, that this entity isn't something to be feared, not, you know, not representing the danger like others might say, but rather kind of representing this non-spirit, non-human entity mm -hmm. that just resides in this very special place. Um, very cool, very cool stuff. But um, author Shiva Dakal told BBC, kind of as I was indicating, quote, perhaps folk tales of the Yeti were used as a warning or likely of morality so that kids wouldn't wander far away and they would be always close and safe within their community, which makes a lot of sense, right? Yeah, I mean, growing up, I'd be terrified if there was some kind of like, I don't know, big old creature like that. That my mm -hmm. family was telling me about. I mean, I believed in Santa at one point in time, so. I mean, and that guy's terrifying. You don't, you don't want to cross him. Yeah, on the naughty list. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> weird, what a weird concept. Very this man strange. Just jumps into your house and drops gifts off and takes your cookies and milk. Very strange. Very strange. Um, and the last theory that I have on my notes is is that you know the Yeti is real. Uh, or perhaps a cousin to Bigfoot or is Bigfoot. I mean, the Yeti and Bigfoot are very often compared. And again, we did a whole episode on Bigfoot. I encourage you to check it out. It was a lot of fun. But like we saw with the Bigfoot, it is often theorized that the Yeti could just simply be an undiscovered animal species. And again, like the Bigfoot, it is 
an area of the planet that is is very treacherous, uh, or maybe not so treacherous, but uh, uh, with regards to Bigfoot, but can be very isolated. Right, not easily accessible. And everyone's there you gonna go. go. Just like, hey, I'm just gonna go walk up into, you know, you have to have gear, training, exactly. so many like aspects to it. You can't just wander in there. So it's that isolation that, I mean, that's really where my heart lies. And that's why I want to be a believer, because as much as the science part of my brain says, nah, I mean, I love the idea that there is something so close to home, but is inaccessible because this planet is huge and there could be something hidden there. I mean, again, we refer to this. We talk about the water all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And we talked about the Amazon and how, I mean, there there are creatures on this planet 100% that we are still discovering. And I find that so freaking cool. Yep. I, I agree. Yeah. But with the amount of similarities between these two cryptids, you know, with the physical features and the behaviors and all of that, many wonder if, for example, these aren't different species, but rather maybe different breeds of a similar animal family. Uh, I don't, uh, genus I don't know. I don't remember uh, biology, but that these could be essentially like cousins uh, that maybe over the long history of this planet, one kind of migrated to one section of the planet and then they kind of diversified from there. But um, I, I kind of like that idea. I think that'd be fun to to think about. But hey, I'm again, I would just want to know why they stayed. There. Yeah. Harsh conditions, not a lot of food. But I guess when you become specialized, maybe you just kind of like, eh, this is it. True. Yeah. Some kids never leave their hometown, you know, <laughs> see that big wide world. Yeah. They just want to stay there. I guess uh, to, to kind of support this last claim, Jillian wanted to put this in here. And I think it's a fantastic fact, but also really, really drives home this potential theory. Because when you consider the giant panda, this is something I, I genuinely did not know. Okay. Giant panda. The giant panda is, is essentially just the panda. The panda that we all come to know that eats mm-hmm. bamboo, mm-hmm. black and white. Now, it was believed to be a myth by Westerners until as recently as 1869. And I mean, that really isn't a whole lot long ago, especially when you consider the the length of humanity. But wait, seriously? Yeah. And that's, I mean, obviously in a very similar area of of the Asian continent. But yeah, I mean, if, if you can have something that is as obvious as like, well, now in hindsight, as obvious as the giant panda is no longer myth then maybe there's some day in the far future, 100, 200 years from now, where we got Yetis kicking it around in a, a hopefully a very ethical zoo, you know? That would be wild. But yeah, I, dude, I didn't even think about that. So like pandas are just like, oh, that's a myth. It did, they don't exist. I guess so. I mean, specifically by Westerners, right? And Right. So like you have people that would be local to the environment that the panda lives in and they go, of course they exist. And then because of, I mean, Photographs are barely existing at this time, right? Uh, yeah. I, I, I don't know. But yeah, I mean, like, it, it's all the limitation of our own knowledge and technology. And, uh, you know, we're, we're very advanced now. And so one would think that there would be very little hidden from us. But again, there are still, I mean, smaller creatures, to be fair, bugs mm-hmm. and fungi and things that are still being discovered. But you're right. I mean, the ocean alone probably houses so many creatures oh, that we do so i mean many dude the i think we talked about are so vast yeah and i think we talked about like the giant squid for example like mm-hmm. in, in the yeah. bigfoot episode like that was something that we only recently had footage of and it was only theorized from things being washed up on a rare occasion over the last few decades but yeah i don't know and, and i think that that part keeps my little intrigued brain alive uh, that little spark of curiosity but the last theory idea thought i wanted to have and i thought this Mm -hmm. was the most appropriate episode to put it out in otherwise dang if it ain't a whole episode zombies oh okay i thought it was gonna be owls again or something like that (laughs) i really thought it was gonna be owls no no i love that you said oh zombies oh okay that's fine owls Mm. (laughs) dude (laughs) what the we talk about owls all right zombies make sense so this is just this isn't in my notes it's all off the cuff this is from like cryptid talk essentially but uh no 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 this is from the conspiracy iceberg a shout out by the way to youtuber wendigoon uh that's his name you should check him out he's awesome um anyway he's a newer youtuber but he's really exploding he does a lot of icebergs anyway one of the icebergs he talks about is uh involves zombies in the himalayan mountains and how people went on um hikes and obviously like expeditions to the Himalayas and guides would tell them preemptively about these entities, these zombies, these, uh, these 
human-like creatures, what? whatever they were, that would just kind of be wandering around out there. And that when summoning the mountain or just kind of making your way through the area, if you saw one, to not look at it, to not give it any attention, lest it kind of catch your eye and, and start coming your way. But I don't know. And so there's a lot of anecdotal evidence about people seeing zombies out there. And maybe uh, maybe the Yeti is just a big guy. Maybe he's a big zombie, right? Just a big zombie? Yeah, like winter is coming. You know, we got the the White Walkers up north. Maybe they bit a couple giants and uh, now they're coming. It's just interesting. Like, why wouldn't he attack people then? That's I, I don't know. They, they seem docile until otherwise like jostled, maybe. Mm, I don't know much okay, about it. it see, this yeah. is me, again, just scratching the surface. But I felt like... You know, I would I'd be remiss if I didn't mention them right at least lightly because you know you got zombies potentially in the Himalayas, you got the Yeti potentially in the Himalayas. Dude, who's to say it's not some type of uh, virus that is just frozen? Mm -hmm. We did say that there was a parasite in some fecal matter that uh, was undiscovered. Who knows? Maybe the zombie outbreak is actually a parasite, and not so much a uh, Dude, virus. I mean, it, that's so crazy, though. Like, there could be something frozen out there, and it just mm, don't say that. <laughs> oh, because there is. Mm, global warming's gonna screw us up in ways we don't even know. Dude, could you imagine, like, you thinking global mm, warming, think and it. then like, oh my god, like the melting, and maybe bro, a that's too real, or, dude. Or, oh, but, I, but really, it just like unleashes some type of. It's uh, totally plague, possible. Virus creature. Who Bro, knows? it's totally like, possible. I hate to say it. It's totally possible. So crazy, dude. It's so. There it's, are underwater lakes in Antarctica that have been discovered that are liquid bodies of water that are highly salinated, right? They're very, very salty. Hence, uh, I mean, when you add salt to water, it drops the freezing point. So thus they can stay very cold, but not frozen. And so they have these pockets uh, under the, deep under the ice that have been undisturbed that I think they're still exploring to this day. So this is me again, kind of just speaking off the cuff. I, I need to fact check myself here, but um, early signs are like some, there are theories basically that there might be signs of life or, or uh, microbial at best, right? Not like giant fish or whatever, but it's that stuff that really freaks me out, right? Global warming, thaw that permafrost, release some sort of uh, bacterias and viruses and ancient things into the air that we so, are not ready for. So possible. Man. It's very possible. And I hope we're not talking about 2022 right now because oh, I can't handle it. Oh, God. <laughs> that just be, it's just be too much. Yeah, man. Well, ending on that very high, low, scary note um, about the world potentially ending in various other ways. Uh, that's, that's been the Yeti, Fredo. Uh, how do you feel? Did you learn something today? Uh, I mean, <laughs> it, it was it's fascinating. I mean, I've learned yeah, there's a yeah. handful of things that I learn. Um, that's mm -hmm. one of the cool parts about like doing all this stuff, even if I don't believe in it. It's just like, oh, so that's why that's that way. Or yeah, I didn't know that it was like kind of off of the uh, uh what is it, the abominable snowman? Yeah, I guess it like it it fed into that, but then also a depiction of that fed back into the yeti. So it's like this chicken or the egg. Right, it's all with, it's all like very interesting stuff. Yeah, um, I'm more stuck on the terrifying note that we just discussed. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll leave you that. Um, <laughs> oh <laughs> no, that's, my that's the God. thing, man. Like, Yeti is one of those ones, just like Bigfoot. I'll keep saying it. Um, where they're just so well known, like so many people know about them, but when you really dive into the story and the, or the the folklore rather, and some of the sightings and the potential evidence. You really start to pull it apart and go, oh man, there's a lot here that I didn't know about. Whether you want to take it at face value or take it as a story, either way, yeah, deeply fascinating stuff. It's what drives us to do this show, you know? Exactly. I think it's awesome. And then that's why, you know, you're the person that like loves diving into these things. But like <laughs> every time you throw in the hook, I'm, I'm like, okay, let's go. Like, I want to learn more about this. Like, I can't just sit there and go, eh. You know, uh, Yeti. sounds cool, but whatever. It's like, okay, like break down the Yeti to me. Like I've heard about this thing. I've seen it on uh, on TV or a movie or whatnot, mm -hmm. read it in a book. But like, where does it come from? Like, what are the theories around it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you're new to the show, thank you for joining us. We have plenty of other episodes from other mysteries, internet mysteries, true crime, cryptids, all that sort of stuff. I want to give a quick shout out and I want to do this more consistently because Task Force, you, you guys have been amazing. Um, 
You guys have been really cool about sharing our podcast with other people who are mystery enthusiasts like ourselves. And I and I am very humbled by it. I'm very appreciative of it because it is truly the easiest and best way to support this show and help us grow what we do here and enable this show to, to keep having legs and keep doing cool stuff like this. Um, so I want to give a quick shout out to Amiyasha on Reddit. Uh, that's their username for uh, in the non-murder mystery subreddit, which I am a subscriber to and I peruse all the time. Somebody was looking for podcasts and that was one of the top rated comments was was talking about Red Web. And so, hey. yeah, thank you for doing that. I th- there was also somebody else in there. Uh, 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 Eco Dude 74. So thank you guys very much for uh, for sharing the podcast. And I'm going to try to do more shout outs like that because I, I see everybody everywhere shouting out our show on reddit and twitter and youtube and everything and i and i'm just uh, very appreciative of that honestly i mean i say this often but it's actually really cool because like you were an enthusiast and i was the one that was just like very much like enamored by the the whole thought of all this Mm -hmm. all these like mysteries and we don't like do an eight episode deep dive into like one topic we just kind of break it down and now that you know we've really found our rhythm um recording the in the office not for this particular episode the <laughs> holidays but like you know now being in the office it's a lot more of like us goofing around and getting back to the mysteries and going on these different tangents and like to for us to just be ourselves and to be accepted mm-hmm. like that um especially like in a newer space is is really cool and it's an awesome feeling and we can't thank you guys enough 100 percent. this is a show i care i mean i care a lot about everything i do but this show in particular is a, like a true passion project and so to see it resonate with other folks out there is just really cool. Um, and speaking of all of that in one kind of final swoop, I, I'll ask that uh, maybe if you listen to us on Spotify, they just opened or they're rolling out the review function on Spotify. So now not only can you give us five stars on Apple podcasts, if you are so inclined, you can do that on Spotify. So if you want to take just a couple minutes to help support the show in their algorithm, it helps us surface to other viewers like yourself uh, or listeners, I should say. But anyway, that's a new function. Uh, really cool. It, it, I think as of the other day, this is a brand new function. We already have several hundred five-star reviews just like instantly. So thank you all for that as well. I, I truly can't say thank you enough. Um, yeah, help spread the word so the task yeah, yeah. force grows and I can have more meat shields. I mean, what? <laughs> well, you and I are going to tackle the, the Yeti by ourselves. and uh, <laughs> right, yeah, we'll, be, we'll be good. We'll be good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We got this. We got this. Uh, anyway. Thank you all for listening. We'll see you next Monday for another mystery. 